Welcome to our series of three short webinars on Mastering 21st Century Enterprise Risk Management. Today in Part 1, we look at firing failed risk practices. You're about to hear from Greg Carroll, Founder and Technical Director at FastTrack, an enterprise compliance firm based in the Gold Coast. Greg has 30 years of experience in governance, risk management, and compliance, implementing risk management systems that have life and death consequences, such as the Department of Defense and the Victorian Infectious Diseases Laboratories. He also has decades of ERM expertise with multinational enterprises like Motorola, Fosters, and Serco. Following this webinar, you'll get a link to Greg's slide deck. As this webinar series wraps up, you'll be able to get links to recordings of each session as well as an excerpt of Greg's new ebook, Mastering 21st Century Risk Management. Greg? Thanks, Fiona. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, before I start, though, um, I'd like to go back through, without trying to uh, bore you too much, um, so what I see some general misunderstandings in, um, about risk. Although most people think they they understand risk outside the risk fraternity, I believe that there's a fair bit of misunderstanding of actually just what risk is. Like a motor vehicle, risk isn't good nor bad. It's just the level of uncertainty in any situation. Risk management is basically the systems we put in place to identify, quantify, and thereby try to reduce that uncertainty. Then we move on to the big one. Enterprise Risk Management, uh, ERM, as it's commonly referred to. Now, ERM is uh, the integrating of um, all the different risk systems we have in an organisation into a single model, such that um, everyone is kind of uh, uh, involved or uh, aware of any effects of any um, changes to, to any risk in any of those systems. From that, they produced a international standard, ISO 31000, which lays down the principles and guidelines for a good ERM system, or good enterprise risk management system, which we'll be talking about shortly. So, the topic of today, failed risk practices. So what do I mean by failed? By failed, I mean that uh, they've failed to deliver the promised benefits. Outside the GRC fraternity, most senior executives believe that risk management is at best a evil necessity, at worst, uh, bureaucratic waste of time, but most commonly it's just thought of as a failed management fad. But like a weed's a, a plant in the wrong place, a management fad is just a purely uh, poorly implemented strategy. Unfortunately, when it comes to the current perception of risk management, a lot of people in GRC have their heads in the sound. I believe that we need to reassess our whole approach to risk man management. Case at point is um, Ford which uh, recently has announced it's closing in Australia. You know, Ford's been an iconic brand here for over 50 years. Um, its supporters uh, rivaled that of Liverpool versus Manchester at the racing and such. Um, no other product could have really dreamt of that level of uh, consumer uh, support. But in the last 10 years, Ford's dropped from selling uh, 84,000 vehicles a year down to 14,000. I think free fall would be a, a better script of it. An 84% drop in sales. Wow. You've got to ask yourself, where were Ford's management? If we look at Ford worldwide, Ford Focus is one of the top selling cars in Europe. Then you've got the F-150, which is one of the biggest selling pickups in the US. Here though, Ford's products are kind of stuck in the 80s. Uh, Ford basically is out of touch. and Ford had a well-publicised risk management framework in place. But their marketing was non-existent, their customer service was, she'll be right. And using last year's results to budget for next year only breeds decreasing performance. Proactive risk management is about planning for the future, not just reporting the past. Customer surveys, like risks, must be tied to hard corporate objectives, not just feel-good values. Product development's got to be oriented towards advancing customer expectations, not just cost cutting. And marketing, well, it's got to be aimed at developing a market, not just pushing last year's figures. So who says current risk management practices are failing? 
Well, in addition to me and my 30 years experience, the Operas Conference in London this year raised concerns of uh, Operas models in that uh, it was saying that risk management landscapes cha changed vastly over the last 10 years and Operas models haven't kept pace. For those not used to the term op risk, operational risk is just the area around internal operations of a business, you know, predominantly people and systems and processes. I know the talk's supposed to be on enterprise risk management, so why am I talking about op risk? Because most people when they're talking about enterprise risk, risk are really talking about operational risk. I'll have a fair bit more to say about enterprise risk uh, later in this talk. If you add to um, the findings of the uh, OPERIS conference, we then have this, the Milliman 2013 research report on operational risk. Milliman's one of the world's leading consulting firms in the area of risk management and their findings, the key findings on that was that operational risk is one of the major causes of organisational failure and destruction of shareholder value. Now that's a pretty damning statement but they then went on to say that uh, current risk indicators and standard formula are ultimately a very blunt tool. So what do they mean by that? Well, they're basically saying the current risk techno uh, techniques are basically ineffective. Well, we can add to that findings of a, K a KPMG survey this year, again 2013, of more than 1,000 C-level executives and it found that most don't have a consistent way of assessing risk. 20% say that there's no process for, to develop or aggregate risk. 38% rely on self-assessment by the business units and a half have difficulty even knowing what the enterprise risk exposure is. So KPMG's uh, Mike Nolan called it a, a case of outdated thinking being applied to a new world economy. And he went on to say that the corporations have to rethink their approach to risk in every aspect of their business. So how did it come to this? Well, overall, I believe enterprise risk management was overpromised, incorrectly structured, inaccurately implemented, and inappropriately focused, which ended up in basically as we have today, it being ineffective. I'll look at each of these claims uh, in turn. So being overpromised. Well, there's widespread disillusionment with risk management and it's been fed by false promises like uh, using risk to predict the future. I mean, you can't predict the future. If we could, we'd all be sailing around the Greek islands in 100 foot yachts. Then you've got in 2007, all the major banks and finance houses around the world were running quite elaborate risk management models, yet nearly all failed to predict the GFC. And the GFC wasn't a failure of financial risk, it was a failure of operational risk. And that's because all aspects of life, including business, are controlled by three indisputable laws of physics. Number one is the second law of thermodynamics. Generally put, things are going to get worse. The second is the uncertainty principle, you can't tell when. And the third is chaos theory, which is you can't predict the weather. But you can take an umbrella. So for those not um, conversant with the chaos theory. Uh, contrary to popular belief, chaos isn't random. It refers to the variable outcomes of a deterministic system. That is, given a specific start point and a constant environment, you can predict a result. The only problem is, in the real world, and due to the uncertainty principle, you can't have a specific point and you can't have a constant environment. Uh, there will always be slight differences and those differences are going to produce vastly differing results. You know, we, we know about uh, with weather, we know that a high pressure system will always give way to a cold front and the cold front will have strong winds in front of it and heavy rains behind it, but it, we still can't predict the weather. So chaos theory is also commonly referred to as the butterfly effect, where theoretically a butterfly beating its wings in the Amazon can cause a cyclone in China. It can't, and I know they call it a typhoon, but from that we can probably glean the fact that business is chaotic. And although we can't predict the future, we can plan for the possible outcomes. And that's what risk management's really all about, preparing for the future. Just like with a, a cyclone, um, when you get a cyclone warning, you batten down things and you put 
loose stuff away. Well, that's what we really want to do with risk management. We want to plan for the future. There's an old saying which goes, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, and proper preparation prevents uh, poor performance. <laughs> Try saying that. Well, the purpose of risk management really is to assist the planning of the future. And really, planning is not a management fad. Okay, let's get down to the, the heart of the problem, or my perception of it. Um, throughout the 2000s, early 2000s, the, the buzzword in risk was enterprise risk management. It was predominantly pushed by software vendors, and the problem is most of these systems apply the same risk methodology across all aspects of the organisation. Regardless of the different nature of the risk and the different risk appetites within the business. Most enterprise risk management or operas systems uh, that attempt to use a predefined standard uh, methodology really are ignoring a fairly basic concept of uh, the nature of risk. So just let me talk about the nature of risk for a moment. Um, you've got my graphic up there. Uh, what I'm trying to highlight to you is that under a under a risk, uh, enterprise risk management system, my belief is that contrary to probably what most of you guys have read and believe, I, I see strategic risk as the umbrella over the top of the other areas of risk. And we group the other areas, or I've grouped the other areas here, under what I refer to as the nature of risk. And that's because that they have different characteristics, they're, they're different ways of managed, and um, they're different ways of mitigating or con uh, handling uh, the fallout from them. So financial risk, I can hear probably a number of you calling out about. I've graded that under what I refer to here as technical risk. It, um, it also covers other areas like medical and uh, engineering risk. So we're talking about risks that tend to be uh, quantifiable, um, which we can put in place fairly elaborate mathematical models, and they tend to be predictive in nature. So from that, we then go to the operational risk, which I mentioned earlier is probably where most people, when they're talking about ERM, are really talking about this area of operational risk. And it covers, as I mentioned earlier, about people and processes. It tends to be qualitative in nature, in other words, subjective. And it's managed through, currently, the flavour of the month is process management. A lot of people may not be aware, but there are other ways of hand, uh, managing operational risks other than process management. But uh, I'll have more to say that in, in the third talk uh, in the series. Then the other two areas there. Now, the four areas I've got here, I'm not uh, claiming to be um, the full extent of different natures of risk. I'm, I'm just using four different ones to highlight my point that uh, there are different concepts of risk involved. The third one I've got here is the uh, Black Swan event. Um, it covers unpredictable once-in-a-lifetime events, such as the GFC and um, pandemics, w widespread national uh, natural disasters. Until recently, we've always ignored them because of their infrequent and they're catastrophic in nature, um, and we didn't think uh, our system should take them into account. The only trouble is these once-in-a-lifetime events are becoming more common. So if, if they can't be predicted, how do you manage them? Well, you, you manage the, uh, the effects of, uh, of those events. So you, we have you know, disaster planning and relief planning in place for them. Uh, then we've got security risks. Now, security risks are, um, again, different in nature from the other risks because they're actually aggressive in nature. People are actually making a uh, conscious decision to attack us. So it covers the areas of fraud, cyber, security, and terrorism. They're premeditated, and we manage them through defensive and uh, normally a physical type of um, control, whether it be firewalls or, or even proactive counterattacks. As I said, I'm not seeing these as an exhaustive list, and um, in a few of the forums around, there's been some other discussions of um, things like reputational risk and such. All I'm trying to say is there are multiple different uh, concepts of risk and the basic concept of trying to put all of those into a single framework is close to being ludicrous. What we really need for a true enterprise risk management system is that we've got to have a system that allows the coexistence of multiple risk frameworks, not a single framework handling the whole lot. And with those um, different 
frameworks, we have to allow for um, what I refer to as horizontal aggregation, not just the traditional vertical consolidation of risk. And that aggregation's got to be able to occur between these different natures of risks, between operational, financial and, and black swan and such. So what do I mean by aggregating risks horizontally? Well, let me try using the collapse of ANSET as, a, uh, as an example. The failure of ANSET, uh, well, ANSET first of all was uh, one of Australia's largest airlines, so hopefully most of you are probably aware of it. It was equal to Qantas at one point in time. Then back in 2001, uh, a failure of IT governance or data governance resulted in poor record keeping, which led to the Civil Aviation Safety Authority grounding some ANSET aircraft. Although that grounding was only short-lived, the loss of consumer confidence from a safety issue eventually led to the airline's corporate collapse. That is, we had an IT risk failure that led to a regulatory risk failure that led to a strategic risk failure. So I'm leading on from that that risk management must be interconnected uh, in all the different areas if it's really to be effective and reactive to events when they occur. The problem with the, the more common standardised approach to enterprise risk management is that it's process based and therefore builds into silos where changes in one part or one nature of, a, of risk aren't propagated through to other areas. In the classic GFC scenario, uh, when the fi financial models started reaching their risk limits, it should have triggered greater ethical controls in the op risk side of the business. Well, let's leave that for the moment. Um, I'll move on to some of the other things I, um, I think have caused the failure of risk uh, as, as it's currently worked. The next area would be um, that I believe that it was inaccurately implemented. And that stems from what I believe to be unrepresentative risk modelling uh, to evaluate risk. Uh, if we go back to the Milliman report that I was talking about earlier when it said that basic risk ind indicators and standard form formulas are ultimately a very blunt tool, it's really talking about um, this common uh, matrix method of of uh, assessing uh, risk values. They were essentially designed for ease of use, not for their effectiveness. And um, you know, the the basically taking a, a two-dimensional array for probability consequences, and then aggregating the result of that up a, a tree, you basically produce a meaningless value. Um, although it's better than nothing, it really has very little relationship to the real world. Milliman uh, went on to say, and it's a good report that uh, I do recommend, and I'll, I'll be putting into the um, re resources at the end uh, of uh, this talk um, links to a number of these um, things, because the Milliman report is well worth reading. It's 100 pages, but um, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, it goes on to say that uh, the structural and causal um, risk models are the emerging best practice. Um, and I'll be dealing with those in, in the third talk uh, in this series. Um, as stated in the Op Risk Europe conference again, um, they went on to say that hanging on to these old models created a false sense of security among senior management, which only increased the, ris uh, the risks or the risk of not managing risk. And um, again, just to highlight Michael Nolans from KPMG, that it's a case of outstand uh, outdated thinking in a new world economy. So this is what I'm getting at. So on the left here, we've got the traditional risk silo model, which each area doing their own thing in isolation. And then we on the, um, on the right, we've got the neural network uh, model approach, where you've got multiple connections, where everything is related to everything else. Uh, under the traditional model, everything consolidates up to the top, while under the neural model, information flows uh, in both directions and is reactive in both directions. Um, so there's a fair bit that I can recommend for you to read up on uh, neural models, which again I'll be talking about more in the third series. So next major issue is that of it being inappropriately focused. So what do I mean by in inappropriately focused? Well generally risk management has been negatively focused. We always talk about the 
risk preventing a problem. And the first part to really understand getting to the heart of this is the concept of risk appetite. Uh, risk appetite is the level of risk that can be tolerated on an ongoing basis and from both a strategic and a cultural perspective. Now the first thing I, I want to stress, which um, most things written on it doesn't um, relate to, is the fact that risk appetite varies dramatically within the one organisation. Um, and could vary from business to business, um, say domestic work to international um, or export work, and from department to department. So marketing versus finance will have two totally different risk appetites. Even up and down the, the management chain, um, different levels within the organisation will have different levels of risk appetite um, between operational management and executive level, for example. And the thing is, you can't tell people what level of risk they should be comfortable with. So I know we, you can educate, which is all a big part of it as well, but basically people have to be comfortable in, in the work that they do. And the next thing is be aware that the elimination of risk is not always the objective and sometimes not even desirable. Hence the picture of Steve Jobs here and his quote, in any business, um, Business improvement and development strategies all involve doing something different to your competitor and therefore taking a risk. Doing it better, faster, cheaper exposes the risks of costs overruns, slow to market, reduction in quality and so on. Without taking a risk in today's uh, agile business environment, it's the surest way of business failure. Doing nothing is your biggest risk. So too often um, risk managers are risk adverse. Managing risk and avoiding risk aren't the same thing. There's a propensity for risk adverse people to rise to managerial positions in risk management. But just as an overprotective parent can inhib inhibit a child's potential, so to a risk adverse manager can inhibit the potential of a business. The problem is really comes down to focus and focusing on the negative aspects of risk. So when they refer to controlling risk, really what they're talking to about, it's just another euphemism for restricting. Risk managers have to reor reorient their focus to achieving positive outcomes. Their role should be to provide proactive and value adding tools and guidance to operational management. Just as risk is an uncertainty, it's an opportunity as much as being a threat. By focusing on the negative, we're only relegating risk management down to a support role within the business. Whereas if we use it as a tool for driving um, growth through opportunities, we're going to actually become an invaluable part of a business. It, it's, it's the old glass half full, half empty syndrome. Risk managers have to promote the positives of risk management if they want to be players in the future of the business. There was also a, a survey done fairly recently, which um, the number one uh, complaint most risk management and compliance managers, to be honest, uh, was um, poor pay. But when you look at it, um, pay is related to the uh, contribution to the, the bottom line of a business. Um, your investment bankers are always going to get paid more than your nurses. It's not a good thing, but that, that's a fact of life. And while risk managers stay in the area of being um, supportive and providing support to business, um, they're not going to get paid as much as if they are drivers for change and improvement in the growth of the business. So just to quickly summarise what I've done there, we have to accept the fact that risk, the whole risk management landscape's changed and we've got to change with it. We've got to accept that um, you know if we're talking about a thousand worldwide sea level uh, uh, executives disappointed with um, the expectations and outcomes of um, risk, we've got to do something about it. We've got to develop a strong risk culture and we've got to accept the fact that that's not easy to do. We've got to look at the, the method of risk assessment using the old structure, uh, the old blunt matrix and look, try to change to more of the, uh, uh, the scenario based um, best practices, again, which I'll be talking about in the third week. We've got to look at this whole neural network situation. Risk has to be affected by everything else in the business. It's all got to be interconnected, not just consolidating up. Uh, and that's the horizontal. 
the black on uh, black swan events we've got to start taking into account and there's modeling available for that and generally risk management we've got to change it to being a tool for preparing for the future not just predicting uh, or recording what happened in the past Albert Einstein once quipped that uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We in risk, we've got to stop peddling the same old snake oil and start justifying existence by adding value, not just supporting the business. So um, how can we revitalize risk management in the 21st century? Well, the seeds of the solution can be found in the causes of the failure. And again, I'll be talking about how we can do these more in the, the third talk in the series. But just to recap again, um, we've got to use real model, uh, real world models um, and not just a one size fits all approach to enterprise risk. Um, those models are going to be integrated and uh, to handle the end to end, -to -end butterfly effect. They've got to be outcome focused, not process focused. And they've got to be driven by an objective to increase shareholder value. It's a big point of what I'll be covering in the third series. We've got to promote it as a, a tool for learning and for growth. And we've got to learn to communicate like it's the 21st century. Well, that's it. Um, next week, I plan to look at the secrets of implementing uh, risk management systems. I'm not talking about software here. I'm talking about um, achieving the cultural change that's needed for the effect. So thank you for your time. I hope you can join me over the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We'll be answering the questions generated by our audience in a forthcoming blog post, so do please check back with us at www.fasttrack365.com for those Q&As, or to get in touch directly with Greg Carroll. Thanks again, and we look forward to our Part 2 on September 12th at 10 o'clock Australian Eastern Standard Time. Goodbye. <laughs>